Good morning, welcome to the CAVE webinar for Wednesday the 23rd of September. Today we're looking at mental health awareness with Sally Besborough. Hopefully you'll know by now, my name is Jordan and I'm the Regional Services Administrator here at CAVE. I'll be your moderator for today's session. We do like to make these interactive, so please do send through any questions or comments that you have. You can do so by emailing webinars at cbld.com, tweeting us using the hashtag CAVECPD, or you can send in questions and comments using the questions tab that should be appearing on your screen today. So today your presenter is Sally Desborough. So she is a mental health first aid trainer. Sally has a background in HR and started her move into the wellbeing sector, specifically mental health in 2017. Having recovered from her own experience of mental illness in 2016, she came out of the other side of her recovery, wanting to raise more awareness about mental health issues. She is accredited by the Royal Society of Public Health to deliver mental health first aid courses, and she writes and delivers bespoke workshops as well. Her experience in facilitating learning sessions started a number of years ago during her HR career, and she has now delivered courses to well over 250 people in mental health first aid alone. If you would like to know more about Sally, you can visit her website, www.yourwellbeinghub.co.uk. With that, if you give me a couple of seconds, I'll just hand over to Sally and she can take you through her presentation. Lovely. Thank you very much, uh, Jordan, for that introduction and a very warm welcome to this webinar on mental health awareness. I'm absolutely delighted to be with you for the next hour or so. So please do pose your questions as we go through the content. Uh, like Jordan said, you know, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So as we go through, please feel free to pose those questions. Now, I do realise that Jordan has already done a brief introduction about myself. So I am Sally Desborough, the founder and director of Your Wellbeing Hub, which is a mental health awareness training company. And my background indeed is in HR. So over the course of my career, particularly towards the latter stages, uh, mental health conversations were very much a part of day-to-day -day life, supporting employees in the workplace with various health conditions, whether physical or mental health conditions, but quite commonly a combination of the two, and coaching managers through those mental health conversations as well, designing and delivering different workshops, including you know, mental health awareness in the workplace. And when I think back towards, again, the latter stages of my career, you know, I would say that mental illness and mental health conditions, mental ill health, you know, probably made up for about 50% of all the health cases. So the prevalence and impacts of this on people was very apparent. And again, I was very much a part of people's support network, ensuring that they were safe and appropriately supported um, in their day-to-day -day workplace. As Jordan mentioned, I do also have personal experience of mental illness. So in 2016, I was diagnosed with severe mental illness and it's something that I'm very open about talking about and it was really during that time I noticed how little we talk about mental health, mental illness, all the topics that sit around it and at that time it almost felt unsafe to share my experience. So when I came out of the other side of that I really wanted to do more to raise awareness and encourage those conversations. And you know, I'm just like anybody else. So I really became quite shocked that actually I, I was in a position where I was experiencing that severe mental illness. So yeah, after 2016, towards the end of that year, I made my recovery and in 2017 took the opportunity to become a mental health first aid England training instructor. So I'm accredited by them and by extension, the Royal Society for Public Health to deliver mental health first aid courses. And it's something now I fully commit my time to raising awareness through delivery of different mental health programs. So I left the corporate HR world at the end of last year. So thinking about today, what you're going to get out of today's content. So for our agenda, we're going to be looking at what mental health is and the factors that influence it. So exploring this area 
to deepen our understanding. Looking at ways we can identify common signs of distress, so what we might spot in somebody else if they're experiencing some kind of emotional distress. And looking at ways to protect our mental well-being as well. So different approaches to maximising our mental health. I think this is particularly at the forefront of a lot of people's minds, given the events of this year. Looking at top tips on how we can start positive and empowering mental health conversations, whether those are personally, professional, you know, at work, at home. So um, taking away some top tips that you can think about immediately. And then just covering off, you know, what is mental health first aid? Some people have heard of it, others not. Um, so we'll be exploring that in a bit more detail. And uh, like we've already said, please use the chat functionality to share your thoughts and questions as we go through. And we will have time to look at those during the Q&A at the end. So why is talking about mental health important? Um, important and again feel free to kind of think about this as we, as we go through but when I ask this question to different groups you know I get fantastic responses you know firstly around normalizing conversations about mental health which in itself encourages discussion and creates that permission for people to be able to talk about their difficulties you know if we start introducing mental health conversations into our day-to-day -day, rather than it feeling like a big scary event conversation on its own then actually we can normalize that much more and we don't just have to talk about mental health when we're experiencing poor mental health but just generally how we're feeling day to day secondly we can support others if they're going through a difficult time so if we're talking about that again we're encouraging that conversation thirdly so that we can understand what might be a trigger for others to experiencing poor mental health so again we can provide that support and lastly, if we are you know, increasing our awareness and our understanding, then we are less likely to be worried about having these conversations. So many people worry about saying the wrong thing that actually they say nothing at all, which in the long term can, of course, be more damaging. And on top of that, why is talking about mental health important? It's because we all have it. We all have mental health. This term means a lot of things to a lot of different people and it can be confusing. There are so many different terms and phrases that are used interchangeably. And in the, re in the work that I do, my experience is that when we say mental health, quite commonly people jump to thinking mental illness. That has a negative connotation attached to it. But what's really important to note is that we all have mental health just as we all have physical health. So there may be times where we feel physically unwell in the short term, with a cold or a cough or something like that. Or we may have a physical trauma such as break a finger or twist an ankle that might take some weeks or months to recover from, that we might need some medical support with. Or we might have a longer term physical condition like diabetes, where through medication and lifestyle choices, we can manage that condition and thrive. And we can really think of mental health in similar terms. You know, there may be times where we feel low for a short period, or we may experience poor sleep, which starts to affect how we feel, how we deal with stress, but we are able to recover our normal mood, in inverted commas, if we get that good sleep back. We may also experience a trauma like a bereavement or a car accident, or for some people, you know, the situation that we found ourselves this, in this year has been traumatic. And we may need help to get through that. Or we may live with a longer term diagnosed mental health condition. But again, with medication, if it's required, thinking about lifestyle choices, thinking about our support systems, which are so important, it is possible to manage our mental health and thrive. So we all have emotions. We all have thoughts. We all experience different life events and we react to different situations. We have relationships, some of which may be turbulent. We all experience stress. And the quality of our mental health is shown by a number of different things. And I will move on to that in a moment. Um, and we can see how fluid and changeable our mental health can be. And as I've al already almost pointed to, Mental health isn't the opposite of mental illness. People with a diagnosed condition can achieve positive mental health because they are, are aware of any trigger points. 
they're able to build resilience, able to work and thrive just like anybody else. And some people might experience poor mental health, but not have a diagnosis either. So irrespective of whether we have a condition or not, we can achieve positive mental health. So on that basis, considering we all have mental health, we can think of it as sitting on a continuum that ranges from poor mental health through to positive mental health. And we can sit anywhere on this continuum at any point in time. Now, of course, ideally, we'd like to be at the positive mental health end, but there's no actual final destination on this continuum. You know, generally speaking, someone might say that their mental health sits towards the positive end, However, if they experience three nights of bad sleep in a row, that might start impacting their thinking, their feelings, how they cope with stress, um, how they can make difficult decisions, how much they can concentrate. So you might see a slight dip, but again, that can be recovered by getting good sleep again. And this example alone just highlights how fluid our mental health can be. And as I've already mentioned, irrespective of whether we have a diagnosis of a mental health condition or not, we can achieve positive mental health. And everyone's mental health is different. So what looks good for me would look different for somebody else. Now, when we think about these fluctuations, there are various questions that we can ask ourselves. And it might be something that we look at on a weekly basis to track. So having a look at these questions, how do we think, feel and behave? So if we start to see changes, if we're tracking and we start to see those changes over a long period of time, actually we might need to start thinking about, you know, getting some help or even just sharing our feelings or changing something. You know, how do we cope with the ups and downs of everyday life? How do we feel about ourselves and our lives? How do we see ourselves and our future? How do we deal with negative things that happen in our lives? How do we bounce back from setbacks? That's really, you know, tapping into the resilience aspects. You know, are we able to focus, study, concentrate, make important decisions? Self-confidence and self-esteem, has that changed? What does that look like? And how stress affects us. And I think what's really important to consider as well is that positive mental health doesn't mean being happy and positive all the time. Different situations can cause different feelings, whether that's sadness, anger, anxiety, all of which are completely normal and appropriate for different circumstances. So positive mental health is also about regulating our emotions and being OK with feeling sad or anxious. I think so many people worry about feeling sad when actually it's the most appropriate response. So if someone experiences that sadness for a long period of time and we start to see that impact on somebody's day to day, that is where we might start to see poor mental health. So the fear and anxiety that people have experienced this year is really quite normal, um, you know, in response to, you know, this pandemic. But actually that, that fear and worry, you know, this, that has been so hugely intensified this year. And I will touch that, uh, touch on that later on. The final thing I want to mention is that mental health is part of our overall health and is intrinsically linked with other aspects of life and health. So we know that our physical health and mental health are so closely aligned, as well as our social health and financial health. So there is no health without mental health and whether we realise it or not, we're constantly tapping into it. In our relationships, when we're learning, in making decisions and having conversations and understanding others, in concentrating, we are using our mental health all the time. So when we think again about this year, you know, financial insecurities are really coming to the forefront for people. Um, you know, job insecurities as well, that of course can impact our mental health. Having to be physically distant from loved ones, you know, that's really impacted a lot of people. Again, that impacts our mental health. And of course, physically, you know, if people regularly went to the gym as their, their source of physical fitness, you know, that change has been difficult for people to deal with too. So we can see how intrinsically these pieces are linked. So thinking about factors that influence our mental health, then there are various factors um, that influence our mental health. And some of these we may have already touched on. So if our physical health declines, 
that may impact our mental health. If we experience sudden financial insecurity, again, that can impact our mental health. Now, I have a list here of various different things that can influence um, influence us, and I'm not going to go through these line by line or word by word. And of course, this list is by no means exhaustive. But there are many different things that influence the state of our mental health. So you can see we have physical aspects, emotional or relationship aspects, ongoing issues too, that might cause our mental health to decline. And even positive things or life events can impact our mental health. So receiving a promotion, moving house, getting married, having a baby. So positive life events can also impact our mental health. And a lot of these things, as you look at them, can cause an element of stress which if not dealt with could lead to longer term issues. Okay, so stress I think is one of those words that when people think of it, tend to think of the emotional stress that someone might experience, that emotional strain. If there's an imbalance between the demands and resources that someone has to cope. And I think it's safe to say that stress is absolutely a part of everyday life. And sometimes it can be helpful. So if we want to do a 10K run, then actually we're putting our body under physical stress, but it's helpful to us reaching a goal. And it's no different to having deadlines at work. If we had deadlines to work towards, then that can give us that kind of stress reaction to, to achieve getting that work done. If we don't have deadlines, then possibly the work doesn't get done and we procrastinate. But we can also have unhelpful stress, which if it goes on for too long and we aren't able to effectively deal with it, we may start to see some emotional distress, changes in behaviour. And as I've mentioned, if it's not dealt with over the longer term, then it could develop into a mental health issue. And there is a whole body of research that tells us that mental health conditions or mental ill health often start with stress. I'd also like to note that actually we can have factors that positively impact our mental health. So if we have self-belief, if we have confidence in ourselves, that can positively impact our mental health. If we eat a nourishing diet, if we exercise regularly and rest, you know, have good support relationship, uh, good supportive relationships, you know, as well as other factors, and then we can have. Um, those protective factors that really positively impact our mental health. And I think it's fair to say, again, when we look at this list, that any of these environmental factors that we see can happen to anyone at any point in time. And I guess it's called life. So given that we all have mental health and we all experience some kind of significant life event that could impact us, and considering how busy and fast paced life is, now, it is my view that it shouldn't come as a surprise if someone does start to experience some kind of emotional distress or eventually possibly developing a mental health issue. You know, we live in times of change and uncertainty all the time, but that has really intensified for a lot of people this year. So then thinking about how stress affects us. You know, stress itself isn't a mental illness. And generally, I think it I think of it as an umbrella term of this emotional response to various different situations that can range from you know, getting stuck in traffic on the way to an interview through to something more significant, like a bereavement or experiencing some kind of trauma. And as I've mentioned, too much stress for too long can lead to development of a mental health issue if not effectively dealt with. And stress can affect us in many different ways and it affects our whole being. So first of all, physically, thinking about how stress can impact us physically, experiencing that tension in our bodies. We might experience headaches or migraines, neck pain, back pain. For some people, stomach issues, IBS, shallow breathing, appetite changes. So all these different physical impacts of stress. Emotionally, you know, our emotions might be more on the surface. We might feel low, tearful. We might feel more frustrated or irritable. Behaviourally, we might start to withdraw or become quieter. We might have more angry outbursts. We might see a change in our sleep. We might also cry more. And our thoughts as well. So cognitively, you know, we might have more of a negative outlook or a negative preoccupation 
um, reduced self-esteem too. And this is really the same with mental illness in that it affects our whole being. So whilst it might be a mental illness, it does affect us physically, emotionally, behaviourally and cognitively. And so if that impacts our overall well-being, we may start to see changes in someone. Now, out of these four areas, it's really going to be the physical and behavioural changes that we're most likely to pick up on first. We don't generally see people's thoughts and we don't see feelings or emotions unless they are exhibited through behaviour. So through tearfulness or crying or angry outbursts or being quieter. So in terms of recognising distress in others, there are various signs that we can look out for. So recognising stress or distress. So someone might start talking about experiencing sleep problems or that they're always tired. So people might start talking about this unexplained tiredness. And again, as we go through this, think about what your, your um, warning signs might be for stress or distress. Um, eating and appetite changes, alcohol and our drug misuse, unexplained aches and pains, extremes of emotion, appearing silent, withdrawn or distracted, memory loss, tearfulness, panic, feeling overwhelmed, body language too, so what is someone's body language telling us as well as incoherent speech and thinking more of the workplace as well, we might start to see a lack of cooperation, so people not following usual kind of processes and procedures, productivity problems, so dips in performance potentially, or mistakes being made, a loss of morale and motivation, erratic timekeeping, so if someone is usually on time, you might start to see someone regularly becoming late, um, general safety issues, not looking after their well-being or that of others and safety, might see more absence from work, Presenteeism as well, which is becoming a hugely concerning area for organisations where people are attending work, um, but actually they're unwell, so they aren't able to be as productive as they would be if they were fully well. Overworking as well, so starting to see people working extra long hours, as well as conduct problems. And I have a note at the bottom that change in the person is key. Everyone has their own version of normal everyone's mental health is different and everyone has their own version of, version of normal and it's the change in the person that is key. So what's really important for us to be aware of is what people's normal is. To identify those changes we need to know what people's normal is. We need to take the time to look up and take stock of what's going on around us and even more so now when the majority of us are working remotely. So really finding that time to check in with people to see how they're really doing. And as I've mentioned, if someone is usually outgoing and chatty, who without fail tells you about their weekend on a Monday morning, you know, that is their normal. But if over a few weeks that starts to disappear, tone of voice changes, generally becoming more quiet, then that could be a sign of something going on for them. And likewise, someone else's normal might be of a quieter disposition, However, a change could be showing more frustration, having more outbursts of anger as well. So that people's normal is really important to be aware of. So the impact of mental health issues then. So sharing some statistics with you now. So some of this is historical. So again, as we go through this, just bear in mind how you think this might have changed uh, with the events of this year. So one in four adults will experience a mental health problem of some kind each year in England. And this research was completed back in 2007 through the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey in England. And one in six working age adults will experience depression, anxiety, or problems relating to stress at any one time. And that was the same sur survey, but taken in 2014. Now, the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey in England is completed every seven years. So the next one is due to be completed next year in 2021. So it'll be really interesting to see what those trends look like. And I would imagine that that would be released in around 2023. 
the cost of mental ill health to UK employees is estimated at £45 billion. And that research was published by Deloitte in January of this year. And a big chunk of that between, I think it's £26 and £29 billion is the cost of presenteeism, where people are coming to work um, but aren't able to be as productive because of their the state of their mental health. And that, again, is a real concern for, um, for organisations. And, and really, a lot of this is coming from job insecurity, you know, people remote working where they're more likely to, to be present than um, you know, call in sick and be absent from work. Um, so, yeah, this area is real, of a real concern. And the cost of absenteeism has actually declined as well since 2016, 2017. So we're seeing this shift. Total cost of mental ill health in England is £105.2 billion. So that research, again, was completed in 2016 by the NHS. And half of that cost, about £53 billion, is um, borne by the people experiencing mental health issues and their families. Um, because the impacts are such that people do stop working as a result of their mental illness. And then the last note here that depression rates have almost doubled this year. So the Office of National Statistics have been looking at data and in the period of um, July 2019 to March 2020, depression rates were about 9.7 percent. And in June 2020, that had increased to 19.2 percent. And this is in people who haven't experienced a depression or mental illness previously. So these are rates of previously well people where depression is becoming um, more of an issue. Okay, so managing our mental health. So being mental health aware is now more important than ever. Having an understanding of this topic and how we can manage our mental health, as I've already mentioned at the top of this session, is high on the agenda for many people. This year we have experienced huge amounts of change and uncertainty, which we know is going to continue over the coming months into 2021. So if we are building our mental health awareness, we're building our self-awareness and identifying any issues early on. So we can think about what changes or what support we might be, uh, what, that we might need. But it also means that we can identify changes and have supportive conversations without worrying about saying or doing the wrong thing and I've heard it many times this year and I've requoted it a number of times this year that we're all in the same boat, uh, same storm but we're all in different boats this is something that's really stuck with me we've all experienced the same situation but it's impacted us all in different ways and it's pre presented various challenges that we've had very little time to prepare for or get our heads around so you know in March there was a lot of adapting and a lot of reactive action to deal with the situation. So thinking about well-being approaches for managing our mental health, there are so many different approaches that we can look at and the 10 keys to happier living by Action for Happiness is one of those and you may well have heard of it. Research tells us that people who integrate at least five of these experience much more positive mental health and experience happier lives. And I do want to share this with you because some of it is so, so simple. So our 10 keys to happy living spell out great dream. So the first thing is giving, doing things for others. That can really make us feel good and feel happier. And it doesn't have to be monetary. It could be giving someone some time or helping somebody out. We know that the volunteering effort this year has been absolutely phenomenal, but it could be as simple as smiling at a passerby when you're going for a walk or paying someone a compliment. These small gestures can be absolutely fantastic for keeping positive mental health. If we make others feel good, it makes us feel good. The second piece is about relating, so connecting with people. And again, this has been so important for this year. I've really struggled with the term social distancing because actually we want to stay social with one another. It's just had to look very, very different. So for me, we've kept physically distant. But relating, connecting, keeping in contact with one another, having that social interaction. You know, we saw it earlier, that social interaction can really impact our mental health. Feeling socially connected 
you know, particularly if we're leaving a, living alone, we may need to be more proactive to stay in touch with others and really share how we're feeling. It is better to share how we're feeling earlier on than again, bottling feelings up and letting time go on and we start to feel worse. And I think even if we're living in busy households, again, communication is absolutely key to share about what our needs are. If we're living on top of one another, that can be difficult in itself. So we can start establishing rules and expectations and create zones and make schedules um, for each other if, if we are working uh, remotely, giving each other space and appreciating those differences. Exercising is absolutely, absolutely one of the core ways that we can keep positive mental health taking care of our bodies. It doesn't have to be formal structured exercise, but some kind of physical activity that gives us focus and can help us to get us out of our thoughts or worries. Of course, physical activity and exercise re releases endorphins as well, which make us feel good, build new neurological pathways to feeling happier, reduces inflammation in the body. We get a sense of achievement as well, and we are more likely to get better sleep, which of course, is really important for both our physical and mental health. Now, like I've said, it doesn't have to be structured or formal, like going to the gym or going for a 10K run. It could be doing some gardening or dancing around the kitchen or having a water fight in the garden with the kids. Um, although I, I do recognize that the weather has changed slightly, so maybe not for now. Um, but anything that gets the body moving. I would also say in this part that resting is um, imperative as well. It's necessary. If we're constantly doing things all the time, being really busy and not taking the time to physically rest, then in the longer term, again, we might start to see a decline in our health. So for me, you know, being kind to ourselves, getting past this notion of laziness, sometimes actually we need to do nothing but rest and, and that's okay. Awareness. So thinking about the A of our great dream, awareness. Um, also what others call mindfulness as well. So for some, this can feel like a really hard practice to achieve, but actually we can be mindful all the time and aware of our surroundings and what we're doing. And again, you know, if we're constantly thinking and we constantly have these worries, actually being aware and completely present in the moment can effectively reduce any feelings of anxiety or worry. So certainly for me this year when I've gone for walks, you know, I've looked at the sky, looked at the clouds, you know, heard the wind rustling in the trees and that might sound quite strange but actually when you're doing that and focusing on those surroundings like I say you're not you're not in your thoughts and you're not in your worries and you're not in your oh I've not done that I need to do that um, and there's so much research behind you know awareness being mindful being present that it can reduce stress can reduce low mood and supports our physical health too. And the next one is around trying out, keep learning new things. So trying something new, learning a new skill gives us the opportunity to stretch our brain and get a sense of accomplishment or achievement when we complete it. And it also exposes us to new ideas and helps us to stay curious and engaged and can also help to boost our self-confidence and resilience as well. So for some people, they've been learning new languages this year, which has been fantastic for them. But again, it's what works for you. You don't have to try all these things. I think if you try everything, then actually it starts to feel really, really hard. But if you try one thing for a few weeks, then that can make the difference. And then moving on to our dream. So the great dream. So again, these 10 keys to happier living. So direction or goals to work towards can give us a sense of purpose which again, it's really important for building our resilience. And these don't have to be big, huge life goals, but even small daily things. Tomorrow I would like to have achieved X, Y, and Z. Now, these can be particularly helpful if we are experiencing some kind of low mood. It does help to provide that structure, provide a bit of routine, and it could be as simple as, tomorrow I'm going to go to the shops and pick up some food. It really doesn't have to be complicated, but if we set it out and we can tick it off, to get that sense of achievement. Resilience and finding ways to bounce back, again, is really key here. Um, so there are many ways that we can develop our resilience and this can include tapping into our coping mechanisms during times of stress. Talking to someone that we trust about how we're feeling is a really fantastic way of developing resilience as well as taking care of our bodies, so the exercising piece. 
but it could be anything else that makes you feel good or things that you enjoy. So it could be listening to music, it could be reading or going for a walk, doing some yoga, it could be doing a jigsaw puzzle. Again, lots of people are doing that this year. You know, being silly or finding things to laugh at. Laughter is such a fantastic way of, you know, letting our brain truly switch off. And we and when we do laugh, we can feel the positive effects for it um, for up to an hour afterwards. You know, developing a mindset too that sees challenges as opportunities and not threats. And there are so many ways that we can build our resilience. And again, that's a skill that we can learn. Our emotions then, so looking for what's good, which at times can feel really difficult. So often we dwell on the not so good stuff and focus our attention and time on things that are negative. However, looking for the positive and appreciating what we do can be fantastic. Research tells us that practicing gratitude can build, again, new neuro neurological pathways to feeling happier. This doesn't have to be you know, a big and difficult process. It could be as simple as each evening before you go to bed, thinking of three things you're grateful for from that day. So it could be that you had a great conversation with Bob and you feel that you've moved forward with Project X, that you're really grateful for the, the roof over your head and the love of the children, whatever that might be. If we do that consistently, while initially it might seem, what is this, what am I doing? Actually, over time, that can really improve our mental health. And I read an article last week that actually if we do that consistently over 21 days, we can start to see those positive impacts. Acceptance, being comfortable with who you are. We know that life isn't perfect. We know that we aren't perfect and things aren't always going to go as planned or the way that they want. We are human after all, so when things don't go right, being self-compassionate and kind to ourselves rather than self-critical is much better for us. And also if we're feeling like we're having a bit of a, a down day, rather than saying, what's wrong with me? We could be saying things like, I feel rubbish today, but I'm okay and I'll feel better tomorrow. So being much more kind to ourselves and self-compassionate. And just quickly while we're here, I'd like you to think of a time when you felt low, sad, anxious, when something didn't go quite right, and how you spoke to yourself in that moment. What did your inner voice say to you? And now thinking about a time where a friend shared with you a time that they were sad or anxious or something didn't go quite right or something didn't go well, and how you spoke to them. And when you think about these two different scenarios, was the way you spoke to yourself the same as the way you spoke to your friend or was it different? So most of the time we are quite self-critical and self-compassion is all about learning how to treat ourselves as a friend. So speaking to ourselves as we would a friend rather than beating ourselves up. And again, it's something that takes practice, catching those thoughts, catching that inner voice early to stop yourself and again you know being completely transparent that's something that I've learned to do this year but it does take time. I think it's acceptance is also important around you know, I've mentioned it already those feelings of sad sadness of anger of anxiety allowing those thoughts and feelings to come up and not trying to suppress them or eradicate them you know accepting them is really great for our mental health and trying to let go Talking out loud can be helpful. Actually, I feel scared today. That can be a really cathartic process or, you know, even saying it to the cat can be really helpful rather than just keeping it inside. And lastly, meaning. So being part of something bigger, really finding those activities, interests and hobbies that bring meaning to your life and gives you a sense of community. People who have meaning and purpose in their lives are generally happier, feel more in control and get more out of what they do. They also experience less stress, anxiety, and depression. But where, where do we find meaning and purpose? And it could be in all sorts of places. It could be through the, walk, the, the work that we do, you know, the job that we do in, in the teams that we work in. It could be, be being a parent, it could be our religious faith, any of those things. And the answers vary for each and every one of us. But they involve being connected to something bigger than ourselves. Okay, so that is our 10 keys to happier living. And like I've mentioned, don't try to do everything at once because that's when things can start to feel impossible or very difficult. So just trying to build some of these things into our daily 
life, whether that's, you know, in the evening, three good things that's happened during the day, or it might be exercising for an hour a day. So whatever works for you. So how do we have a conversation if we notice something? We've covered some information about signs of distress, but what do we do if we notice something, a change in someone or with concerns? So this next section will give you some top tips on things to think about when it comes to having these positive and empowering mental health conversations. What I will say is that you don't have to be an expert at this. Acknowledging that you've noticed a change in someone can really alleviate any anxieties that someone might be experiencing or that fear of judgment as well. We know, like I've said, that there is a lot of fear and worry about saying the wrong thing. So we may say nothing at all, but actually, you know, it's coming from a good place. So be confident um, with with this conversation that you're having. So my three top tips for you, first of all, is about choosing a setting, choosing a safe setting to have a chat. You know, at a time and place where you won't be distracted or interrupted, a private space where someone would feel most comfortable that allows for privacy and confidentiality. And everyone is individual, so this will look different to different people. You know, if we are back in the office, then it could be, you know, booking a meeting room and ensuring that, you know, colleagues aren't going to be walking in and out or through the area. But it could also be having a cup of tea together, grabbing some lunch, going for a walk and talk. Going for a walk and talk is so powerful because it's the least in intimidating way to have a conversation, walking side by side. And therapists are actually using this as a common practice now, too. There is a lot of remote working going on, which I am mindful of. So it could look like having a video call a voice call or even having a walk and talk over the phone again thinking about privacy so if you are having these conversations at home and you live in a busy household just be mindful of who can hear the conversation because we need to be thinking about that all of the time we want to avoid those interruptions so switching mobile phones off and giving someone that full attention is imperative and as I already mentioned, these conversations don't have to be an event all on their own. We can start to build these conversations into other day to day conversations. So it starts to become a part of you know, normal everyday life, and not just when we notice a problem or a change. My second tip is about having a conversation about feelings. And I've got some examples up here. How are you feeling at the moment? How long have you felt like this? Do you think there's anything going on at work that's contributing or anything going on at home? Is there anyone else you've spoken to that you've shared with how you're feeling? When it comes to any conversation about mental health or emotional distress, we always want to start with feelings discussions. Many mental health issues can manifest themselves in different ways. And like I've mentioned, physically, behaviorally, emotionally and cognitively. And we might start to see these changes in behavior and physical appearance but there's likely to be something going on. So people don't behave out of character for the sake of it. Quite often behavior is communication. So like I've said, if someone is usually sociable and outgoing, you notice a change to a quieter disposition, then that might be when we start thinking about having a conversation and we start with feelings um, as an immediate starting point. If, however, we do feel that actually we're not getting anywhere with the conversation, because quite often people might have a fear of being judged so they won't share what is going on for them. We can start reflecting back those changes. So it might be, I wondered how you're feeling at the moment because I've noticed that you seem quiet and unusual and withdrawn. So I'm a bit worried about you. Is there anything going on at the moment? So it's very much a welfare conversation, reflecting back those changes. If you have that concern, but people aren't being open. And lastly, thirdly, listen non-judgmentally. So one of the biggest problems in communication is listening or a lack thereof. When we think about our schooling, we don't really have lessons on how to listen. We're told to listen a lot, but we're not really taught how to listen like we are with reading and writing. And quite often as humans, we want to fix people's issues. We want to provide solutions and help, which is completely natural. But with that, that itself can actually prevent us from listening properly. So the best thing that we can do sometimes in these conversations 
is to sit there and listen, give someone our full focus and attention and keep any advice that we might have to ourselves. As soon as we're thinking about advice and solutions, we're in our head and we've stopped listening to what that person is sharing with us. And again, this takes a lot of practice too. It's like any skill. Silence can also be very, very supportive. It allows the person that space to talk and truly by her, uh, truly be heard. And for, pe for a lot of people, sometimes that's all that they, that's all they need is being listened to, having that space to vent and get things off their chest. They're not looking for advice at all or solutions. And as Stephen Covey says, the author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, seek to understand before seeking to be understood, which is something that I reflect on and refer to a lot in my training programs. To effectively support someone, being non-judgmental is a top priority. We want to have an attitude of acceptance and empathy. So truly accepting someone's feelings and experiences for what they are, no matter how trivial they may seem to us. So whatever someone is experiencing, it's real for them. So saying things like, there's nothing to worry about, get over it, pull yourself together. I'm not sure what you've got to be so sad about. That can be really damaging to really people sharing their vulnerabilities. So it's important that we try to keep the chat positive. Okay, so those are my three top tips for starting mental health conversations. And then lastly, what is mental health first aid? So mental health first aid is an internationally recognized training course that teaches people how to spot the signs and symptoms of mental ill health and provide help on a first aid basis, even in a crisis situation. Now, really, this is about prevention. So it's really spotting those signs very early on so that we can prevent the situation from becoming worse. It's not about becoming a counsellor, a therapist or a diagnostician, but teaching us the skills, how to listen, reassure and respond. So it's very similar to physical first aid in that way. We don't learn how to be surgeons on physical first aid courses, but we might be able to you know, put a band aid on somebody before professional help arrives. And that's really you know, how mental health first aid was founded too. And there are various training options from the full two day pro program to the half day, but all of them are designed to raise awareness of mental health and topics relating to mental health, to build skills and confidence in people to have mental health conversations and also build our own self-awareness for ourselves and look after ourselves. And lastly, to tackle and reduce the stigma that is associated with mental ill health. Now, of course, the longer the course, the more in depth and the greater knowledge built. And the two day course really provides a structured but flexible toolkit to having mental health conversations in a range of different scenarios. So there is a greater amount of knowledge and confidence and skills with much less worry about entering these conversations. And like I've said, you know, we're building self-awareness to notice changes in ourselves, which in itself is empowering. And the research telling us that if someone is experiencing some kind of mental health difficulty, you know, the research is telling us that people want to be approached and be able to talk to and approach their peers to talk about it. So, you know, this course is an accessible way to build, build that knowledge. And like I said, prevention is the key. If we are mental health aware and having regular conversations about mental health, then ultimately that could prevent, you know, stress or emotional distress from progressing to mental um, health issues or poor mental health. And that really does close the session. So we have looked at you know, what is mental health and all the different aspects of health, social health, physical health, and how intrinsically linked they are. We've looked at identifying different signs and symptoms of distress in others, as well as looking at the prevalence and the impacts of mental health issues. We've also identified you know, how we can have conversations with people and make that approach to start that mental health conversation. And we've just briefly covered um, what is mental health first aid. So at this um, at this point, I'd like to um, hand over to you and Jordan for any kind of questions that might have been coming in or anything 
as we come to the end of that content. Thank you, Tally, that was great. Um, so anyone who's listening, now is your chance to send in any questions that you may have. Um, I will start off with um, one that we've had sent in. So we've had a member ask, um, hi Sally, when starting a conversation, do you think that trust, understanding and confidentiality are important before taking the steps to try and help someone? That's a really fantastic question. And I think with all these conversations, trust is really important. So when you're having when you're making that initial approach, actually, you might not have that really in-depth trusting relationship, but it could be the start of that. So, again, if someone isn't sharing with you in that conversation initially, it might be, OK, well, would it be OK if we catch up again tomorrow or in the next couple of days just so I can check in to see how you are? I think the listening piece and creating that safe space is really important. If we're jumping in with lots of questions and advice when people really just want to get something off their chest, then that will kind of dis disrupt the trust that's being built. Confidentiality, again, is hugely important um, when we're having these conversations. And again, as organisations, that's something that really needs to be thought about you know if someone is in severe you know in a severe crisis situation then actually confidentiality may not be appropriate but again when we think about this in more detail the mental health first aid programs kind of cover cover that that off but the trust piece is important building that rapport and confidentiality um, is absolutely important and I hope I hope that's answered the question but please please let me know if I've misunderstood in any way Thank you for that. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, um, you can still email them across to myself and I can um, send them over to Sally outside of the session. Um, I just want to thank Sally again for providing the presentation for us all today. Hopefully you've all found it insightful and useful. Um, again, any feedback as well or comments in general, please do send them over to me and I can share them with Sally. Just um, as a note from KPHQ for any members listening, Membership fees are now due, um, but please do note that the board did freeze the fees this year, so there is no increase. Um, so we would appreciate if you get these paid as soon as possible. If you need any support, just contact us here at HQ and we'll do our best to help. Any other questions, comments, feedback in general, send them across to me. Um, our next webinar is on the 21st of October with Simon Roberts from Cordet. So hopefully I'll see you, some of you online then. Um, but in the meantime, please stay safe, stay well, um, and do contact us if there's anything we can do to help.